What does the name Kareem Abdul-Jabbar mean to you? When I hear that name, of course, this image pops up. This shot, the most unguardable and most unstoppable shot in NBA history, the skyhook. A weapon that he used to score many of the 38,387 points that he amassed during his 20-year NBA career. But I have to say that usually when we think of Kareem, we think of Lakers Kareem. In particular, we tend to think of Kareem around this period of time with a balding paint or with the ball head already, goggles, And by this stage of his career, a player that pretty much had one primary role, which was to score in a contributory role, a sidekick, if you will, to the great Magic Johnson. But this doesn't do Kareem Abdul-Jabbar justice because Kareem Abdul-Jabbar is, in my estimation, the second greatest NBA player of all time. And when you encompass all three primary levels of Competitive basketball, high school, college, and professional. He is the greatest basketball player ever. As we sit here at the precipice of war, that being the 2017 NBA playoffs, and of course I'm speaking figuratively, of course, it isn't exactly war. Uh, But before the playoffs start, I want to give a shout out, and this was an idea of one of my subscribers, uh, Victor. Um, I want to give a shout out to Kareem. And this week, uh, I think it's Sunday actually, will be his 70th birthday. And Kareem has been through a lot the last, wow, what, seven, going on eight years. He survived leukemia. And he, a couple of years ago, he underwent a major open heart surgery. And uh, as you can see in this picture right here, Kareem's looking a little bit gaunt these days. And I, I hope we have him around for far, for many, many, many more years. But we saw recently with Charlie Murphy. Leukemia is one of those diseases that can be iffy. And um, I want to do this now while we still have him. And um, here we go. The man we all know today as Kareem Abdul-Jabbar was born Ferdinand Louis Alcindor Jr. on April 16th, 1947 in New York City the only child of one Cora Lillian, a department store price checker, and Ferdinand Louis Alcender Sr., a transit police officer and jazz musician. Uh, As it wouldn't be too hard to uh, believe, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, even when he was born, was a much larger than average baby, weighing 12 pounds, 11 ounces, and measuring 22 and a half inches long. Um, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar learned basketball and played basketball at a relatively early age, uh, but it was when he attended uh, high school and uh, Power Memorial High School where he really began to flourish. When he played competitively, that's when he really began to flourish uh, playing uh, basketball. When Lou Alcindo was only nine years old, he was already five foot eight inches in height, which at the time was the average height for a full grown man in the 1950s. When he was only 13 years old, he was nearly six foot seven and could dunk a basketball. And when he entered high school, that high school being Powell Memorial High School in New York City, Alcindor was six foot eight and immediately inserted into the starting lineup at center. 
And by the time he was 18 years old, he would become a legend in New York City and is probably the greatest uh, high school basketball player in the history of the United States. Uh, it's slightly debatable, but many people will say that, that Alcindor was the best high school player that we've ever produced. Uh, the dominance. Uh, he scored 2,067 points in his tenure with that uh, team, which at the time was a record. They went 79-2 and two during his stretch playing for the high school team. That included a 71-game winning streak. And they won three straight New York City Catholic championships. When he was in 11th grade, they won the National High School Boys Basketball Championship. And when he was a senior, they were, they were runner-ups. It was the beginning of what is, when you encompass all three levels, prep, college, and pro, the beginning of the greatest basketball career of all time. So just how dominant was Lou Alcindor in high school? Well, to put it into perspective, in 2000, and remember in 2000, this was 35 years after Alcindor had finished high school, the National Sports Writers uh, declared Lou Alcindor's Power Memorial team the number one high school team of the 20th century. After he graduated high school in 1965, uh, Lou Alcinda, who was going to go to the uh, college now, the next level, uh, was inevitably compared to the great big men at the time, most notably Bill Russell and, more often than not, Wilt Chamberlain. That's how great he was in high school. I strategically brought up both Russell and Chamberlain because Alcindor had similarities to both men in different ways. Uh, Alcindor was nearly as dominant as Chamberlain, not quite as dominant, but he was nearly as dominant uh, as Chamberlain in high school. And his game in the pros would be nearly as dominant as Chamberlain in some ways, uh, especially on the offensive end. But like Russell, he was conscious. And at a very young age, even when he was in high school, he was very bothered by what was going on in the South. Being from the North, he didn't quite experience racism as uh, deeply as those from the South had. And when he was on certain tournaments in the South, in high school, he finally, for the first time, uh, viewed what racism was about, and it angered him tremendously, uh, to the point where he wanted to inflict violence on the perpetrators of some of the most heinous acts that uh, we have seen uh, in that era. And we knew how ugly it can get in the 1960s. He has stated that he wanted to personally kill the perpetrators were responsible for the bombing of the church in Birmingham, Alabama, which killed those uh, little girls. Uh, that act truly angered him, and he seethed with anger. And uh, this was always... This anger in him... <sighs> probably helped to fuel uh, his on-court play to an extent, uh, his excellence, but it was always submerged, but it was never totally, this anger I'm speaking of, it was never totally submerged deeply. And oftentimes, I think Kareem was bristled and he was surly towards certain reporters. Um, not because he was a person who was mean, but it was more or less because being an intellectual, 
that he is. This is a man who would go on to author 10 books in his career, in his life, I should say, actually, but in his writing career. Oftentimes, when you're intellectual, you tend to internalize things. And oftentimes, you can be detached from people. And this may have come across to many reporters or people who follow him in the media as being a person who was mean and surly, but he really was not. Uh, but I'm, I'm mentioning this now before I forget to mention these things. But Kareem Jabbar was uh, a social warrior uh, and a social justice warrior, a uh, term that's used now. But from an early age, Kareem Jabbar really wanted to seek equality for all people. In 1965, Lou Alcindor was recruited by virtually every major uh, college basketball program in the country, but ultimately Alcindor chose to attend the University of California, Los Angeles, more popularly known as UCLA. And it was there that uh, he majored in history and English, and he became enthralled by the autobiography of the recently slain the civil rights leader, Malcolm X. Now, his rookie year, there was a rule in place called the rookie rule where uh, rookies or freshmen had to sit out as far as playing uh, competitive basketball. So he did not play for the UCLA basketball team his freshman year. Uh, that rule no longer is in effect, of course. Now, his sophomore year, the first year he was able to play, uh, Alcindor showed his dominance, averaging 29 points and 15 and a half rebounds and shot a phenomenal 67%. One of the reasons why, one of the reasons why Alcindor was so dominant that year was because of his frequent use of the dunk shot. Now, he was, of course, not the first player to dunk a basketball, uh, but no player had used that shot so ferociously and as frequently as Alcindor had that year. And because of his utilization of the shot that nobody could stop him, NCAA tried to slow him down. Now, of course, they wouldn't admit it that he was the target of this ban, but everybody knows that this was the Lou Alcindor rule. And starting in 1967, all the way through 1976, if I'm observing correctly, the dunk shot was banned in college. And of course, I'm pretty sure this really angered uh, Alcindor because they were targeting him. They were trying to slow him down. Before the ban took place, Alcindor and UCLA went 30-0, and 0, went undefeated, and they won uh, the national NCAA national title. Uh, but Alcindor would prove that nothing, nothing could slow him down, either him individually or UCLA's dominance in college basketball. The very next year, despite the ban on dunking, the UCLA Bruins were nearly as dominant, going 29-1 and during the campaign and repeating as NCAA champions. During the 68-69 season, UCLA went again 29-1 and and went on to win yet another NCAA championship. In the title game, Alcindor scored 37 points and 20 rebounds. <clears throat> During his impressive collegiate career, Abdul-Jabbar was a three-time NCAA champion, a three-time NCAA Final Four Most Outstanding Player, a three-time National College Player of the Year, a three-time consensus first-team All-American, and his number 33 would eventually be retired up to the rafters at the University of California in Los Angeles.
After posting an abysmal 27-55 and record the season prior, the Milwaukee Bucks drafted Luau Sender in the first pick in the 1969 NBA draft, and they were not disappointed in the least bit. The Milwaukee Bucks more than doubled their win total that season, going 56-26 and 26 behind Alcindor's 28.8 points and 14.5 rebounds per game to go along with 4.1 assists. And the club made it to the playoffs and actually went to the second round of playoffs that year. The 1970-71 season for the Milwaukee Bucks was one of the greatest campaigns of all time in NBA history. The Bucks, behind Lou Alcindor's uh, unstoppable skyhook shot and the acquisition of Oscar Robertson, including a key play from reserves, Bob Dandridge, who I think should be in the Hall of Fame, Bob Boozer and Lucius Allen, led to a 66-16 and 16 regular season and culminated in a four-games-to-nothing sweep of the Baltimore Bullets in the NBA Finals for the team's first and still only NBA championship. Also, Lou Alcindor won his first scoring title, averaging 31.7 points per game to go along with 16 rebounds per game and 3.3 assists per game. He shot nearly 58% from the floor during this campaign. Prior to the start of 1971-72 NBA season, Lou Alcindor officially converted to Islam and changed his name to Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. He would have his second consecutive MVP season, the first being during the championship season of 70-71. And he would go on to average nearly 35 points per game, winning his second consecutive scoring title, though it would be the last of his career to go along with over 16 rebounds a game and more and more than four assists per game while shooting over 57% from the floor. Over the next few years, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar's star would continue to grow. He even appeared in movies. Uh, he was in 1972's uh, Game of Death with the legendary Bruce Lee. Uh, and he would continue to be the best basketball player in the world, uh, winning an MVP award once again during, I believe, the 73-74 season uh, with the Milwaukee Bucks. But there was a growing perception that Abdul-Jabbar was growing uh, frustrated with the management with the Milwaukee Bucks as far as improving the team as the team began to, while they were always good just because of the presence of Abdul Jabbar, I don't think he felt that the team was trying to uh, improve enough. And I think there also may have been this big fish in a little pond type of uh, situation, similar to how Shaq felt about Orlando later on, where he was this outsized personality uh, and this huge star in this relatively small uh, town and uh, ultimately after the 74-75 campaign Kareem Abdul-Jabbar was traded to the Los Angeles Lakers <clears throat> as I said before and arguably the most lopsided trade in NBA history the Los Angeles Lakers traded a pack of bubble gum and some certs to the Milwaukee Bucks for Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. And something happened this season that I think is, re is really uh, relevant to today's basketball. And uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar won the MVP award his first year with the Lakers despite the fact that his team only went 40 and 42 on the year. He narrowly won the MVP race over Bob McAdoo and Dave Cowan to the Boston Celtics. Bob McAdoo, of course, being of the Buffalo Braves, now known as the Los Angeles Clippers. Why did he win the MVP award on a losing team? Because of how dominant he was during the regular season. His team was not very good, 
at all. He had no other superstar, really, that he's playing with. I guess you could call Gail Goodrich an all-star, but I wouldn't call him a superstar. But other than that, he had no other scores, really. And despite this, Abdul-Jabbar won the EVP award, averaging an astounding 28 points per game, 17 rebounds per game, 5 assists per game, 4 blocks, 1.5 steals, and shooting 70% from the foul line, which is very respectable for a 7'2 big man. Kendra Jabbar won his fourth MVP award during this season, which actually could have been rather forgotten. But his play was so exceptional that many people felt that it was warranted to win the MVP award. For the next few years, the Lakers, under the leadership of Creole Dojabar, improved. But they were a team that were good enough to make the playoffs every year, but not quite good enough to beat the championship caliber teams of the mid to late 1970s, that being teams like the Seattle Supersonics or the uh, Portland Trailblazers. Um... Also, there was a period of time where it appeared that Crudel Jabbar's successor in UCLA, Bill Walton, might usurp him in the, in, in the NBA. Walton, of course, winning the title uh, in 1977 with the Portland Trailblazers, winning the MVP award, I believe, in 1978. It appeared that Bill Walton might take the mantle as the game's best big man. But ultimately, uh, injuries derailed Bill Walton's career considerably. And now it's just a, although he is a Hall of Famer due to his career in college, but it's now a what could have been with Walton as far as his NBA career is concerned. The whole trajectory of the NBA and the dynamic of the Los Angeles Lakers changed with the acquisition and, you know, acquisition of Magic Johnson in 1979. Irvin Magic Johnson um, elevated this team, a team that was very good and hoped to win, to become a team that was great and would accept nothing but winning. And this was apparent even from the first game that Magic Johnson played as a member of the Los Angeles Lakers. As the 1980s unfolded, the Kareem Abdul-Jabbar that most of us who are younger uh, were acclimated to see uh, now begins to emerge. A Kareem Abdul-Jabbar who was starting to decline a little bit physically but still was a very potent offensive player uh, was a part of something bigger now. It wasn't just a one-man show. He was still the captain, but he had a top top lieutenant in Magic Johnson. Um other valuable officers and soldiers like James Worthy and Bob McAdoo and his new role as a score off the bench. You had Michael Thompson. You had uh, J Jamal Wilkes and Norm Nixon on the earlier teams with the Lakers. Later on, the emergence of, of Byron Scott, Michael Cooper. Uh, the hustle and bustle of a player uh, like Kurt Rambis. And the Lakers would become the dominant team in the 1980s, winning five NBA championships. And they were the team of the 1980s. When Kareem Abdul-Jabbar retired after the 88-89 season, he had amassed a master career and resume that was uh, generally incomparable. He was a six-time NBA champion, a two-time NBA Finals MVP, a six-time NBA Most Valuable Player, a 19-time NBA All-Star, 10-time All-NBA First Team, five-time All-NBA Second Team, five-time All-Defensive First Team, six-time NBA All-Defensive Second Team. He was the NBA Rookie of the Year, a two-time NBA Scoring Champion, a four-time NBA blocks leader. May have been more had they counted blocks before the 73-74 season. 
1975-76 NBA rebounding champion. His number 33 was retired by both the Milwaukee Bucks and the Los Angeles Lakers. And he's on the NBA's 50th anniversary all-time team. He retired as the NBA's all-time leading scorer. He was the NBA's all-time leading blocks leader, uh, eventually surpassed by Kim Olajuwon, though, as I've said before in my, many of my videos, had blocks been counted during all of Kareem's career, he would have well over 4,000 career blocks. The greatest basketball player of all time and the second greatest NBA player of all time, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Happy 70th birthday.